Hi, Terry, and welcome to everybody out there. Welcome to APF at Home, which is sponsored by the Trust. Uh, the Trust's generous sponsorship of this series allows us at APF to stay connected with you, our loyal donors and friends. Now, I'm Dorothy Cantor. I'm a proud member of the board of APF. I think I am probably uh, the longest serving member, for better or worse, but that's me. Um, we started this series of webinars because we can't visit with you, and we miss you, and we want to bring APF to you in another way. APF is, as you know, the premier private grant-making foundation in psychology, and for those of you who don't know, it's really important for our young psychologists who have trouble getting grants from NIH and MIMH when they don't have a body of work yet. So we are really important. We provide about a million dollars in grants annually and awards. And our goal is to use the power of psychology to create social change. Our grants are always relevant. And we're seeing through this difficult time that psychological science is of critical importance. For example, this summer we announced the grantees who will be receiving our two COVID-19 rapid response grants. They're Dr. Jonathan Comer and Dr. Tanisha Hill Jarrett. We're very proud to be able to do that. I think you probably also know that APF is also unique in that it receives the overwhelming majority of its funding. That's around 95% from individuals and so we're grateful to all of you participating in this webinar who are already supporters of APF. And we hope that you might consider reaffirming your commitment so that we can do even more. Now, I have to give you two disclaimers. One is they're both related to the fact that I live in New York on the 26th floor of a building. It's very windy and gusty here today so you may hear wind. The other sound you may hear is sirens. And when the sirens go by, I will do my best to mute myself if I'm not in mid-sentence, but I apologize for both of those. I also want to remind you that this is a high tech portion of the webinar. You can use the chat function which is either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on whether you're on a, a computer or an iPad. Send us questions. And at the end of the presentation, I will go back through them and bring some of them forward to Terry. Terry Keene, who is of course mm -hmm. our chair. And when he isn't working on behalf of APF, and I can't imagine when that is because he does so much for APF, Terry is the director of the National Center for PTSD at the VA Boston. And he's a professor of psychology and psychiatry at Boston University. Again, I don't know how you do it, all that Terry. Also, if any of you don't know him well, he's a really good guy. And that's probably the most important thing I can say about him. Now, some of you probably noticed that we came through a very difficult year in 2020. I just learned today that the GDP declined 3.5%, which is the worst decline since 1946 and worse even than during the 2009 pandemic. We were very worried, as you can imagine, at APF. So let me ask you the first question for everybody, Terry. How did we do in 2020? Um, <clears throat> well, thank you, Dorothy, and thanks for helping me here today. And it's always a pleasure to see you in New York abode. Um, <clears throat> I would say that this was a very challenging year, 2020. And I would also say that APF has done spectacularly well. Um, I have to say that the board has been remarkably involved, helpful, contributing in so many ways of their time, of their treasure. And the staff of APF 
have been nothing but amazing. Most people likely do not know that the staff have been working remotely, exclusively remotely, uh, since uh, March, since the pandemic hit, and will likely remain remote, um, certainly through June and uh, more likely uh, through to Labor Day when things are a bit clearer and more safe. Um, and they've done simply a spectacular job. I would like to like reach out to each of them and give them a great big hug because so many of them are new in their roles, including Miriam, who's the acting COO, um, who uh, was our major gifts person and then stepped up when we needed her um, in uh, November of 2019 and has done nothing but perform brilliantly for us. And, uh, you know, of course, it's a complicated year. We had um, um, surely the COVID pandemic. We also had uh, racial instability in our country. <clears throat> and we, we've had a number of challenges, uh, not just the work-related challenges, but the economic challenges. But our contributors came through this year in ways that um, I just can't say enough about. So how is APF doing? I have to say somewhat proudly, we're doing very, very well. And Dorothy, when you handed the reins over to me now more than four years ago, hard to imagine, really? hard to imagine. When you handed the reins over, <clears throat> you know, I was sitting there with Lisa Strauss and <clears throat> she said, well, you know, you need to have some goals, Terry. You know how Lisa would speak to me. I said, all right, some, some goals. <clears throat> how about a million dollars in grants and how about $20 million in the bank? Well, we're there. We not only gave a million dollars of grants this past year, we did it two years before that, amazingly enough. Two, you know, 2019 was the first year we broke a million dollars. That was astounding to me that we were able to do this. And as you correctly pointed out, the, um, um, this focus that Lisa and you and David Barlow had on supporting the young people in psychology, trying to give them a leg up, trying to give them a boost in their careers was the right direction to go. And there's so many reasons why I say that. And maybe we'll talk more about that as we go. So we had a great year. We had a, a really amazing year. The philanthropy was good. The PPP, right, um, helped us. Um, we had one round of PPP. And in correspondences that we had with um, Miriam this week, it looks like we might very well be able to get a second round of PPP, which will help offset some of the um, uh, some of the, um, the the needs that we have. Um, we did actually, as you likely know, we set up the um, the APF at Home program, which sponsored by Jana uh, Martin. I think of her as Patterson, but that's a long time ago. Uh, Jana Martin, an old friend of ours, uh, but who uh, runs the trust. Um, and we're able to do this kind of work with a very modest amount of input and support. Um, I will tell you that among the most exciting things for me during the course of the past year was the fact that we brought the APF Gold Medal Award winners into APF at home. And I hope that some of you who are out uh, with us today um, had a chance to listen to these remarkable, incredibly accomplished psychologists, because it was wonderful for me to spend an hour with them. You know, when we give out these awards at APA, uh, they get, I think, two minutes, and then, you know, I sort of like yank them off the stage. Um, to spend, you know, 45, 50 minutes to get a chance to have questions. I think this is a remarkable opportunity for both APF, but as well for people to talk about um, how their career unfolded. And for young people, young psychologists to hear from folks, you know, um, in some instances, there were women who were in their 70s and plus into their 80s who were being interviewed. Now you think young women today have it hard, we do. What was it like for them? And so we had all of this instructive information on these. Uh, Terry, correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, but I think for those people who missed any of those, they are available. They are available. And I'll, t I'll tell you what, um, 
they're on our website. Um, I'm not sure if all of them are yet on the website because it's taking some time a little bit because cool. APA is working um, uh, remotely and that makes everything take a little bit longer, but we will have them all. And um, I know that there are at least two faculty members who would love to um, play the APF at home interview with Bill Cross, an African-American uh, psychologist who um, won um, the gold medal this year because it was so both interesting and very funny. Interviewed by our own board member, uh, Tony Jackson, who, who just did a superb job. I mean, it was, it was very funny. It was deeply informative. And uh, Dr. Cross was a remarkable um, interviewee. Okay, here's a technological update. I just read a message from Miriam that they'll all be up soon. So they'll all be up soon. <laughs> here, please look for them if you yep. miss them because they're very exciting. They so, are. Terry, let me ask you, can you talk a little bit about our new visionary grants that we added this year in response to what's going on? Yeah, I, I can. And, you know, again, this is a point to put, about which I'm really very proud of both APF, but also of our board members. Um, you know, we were confronted with the systematic racism and the Black Lives Matter and the uh, COVID pandemic. And um, uh, with Sandy Shulman's support, by the way, Sandy Shulman had a, a role in this. Um, we'd made the decision as a group that we wanted to um, try to see if we, APF, could contribute in whatever small way possible to um, both of these matters, both the COVID pandemic, but also the Black Lives Matter and the racial instability in, in America. And um, we were able to pivot on a dime. I don't know if that particular metaphor means anything to, if you're from I'm New York, it matters. Give it a bigger number. <laughs> Um, but anyway, we were able to pivot and actually wound up um, 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 making grants in each of these areas. And um, I will say uh, Tanisha Hill Jarrett is a young woman whom you mentioned a bit ago, um, early, early career. I think this is her first job. Um, great background as a neuropsychologist trained at Pittsburgh and um, in Florida and is now on the faculty at USF in Tampa. Um, she had a grant that I was actually one of the reviewers on, and I just thought this is simply wonderful. So as it turned out, she um, made the cut. Um, now, and so she's doing neuropsychological over time of the impact of COVID. Now, this young woman is um, quite a remarkable individual at so many levels, and I'm so pleased that we're able to support folks like this. She... Um, was one grant submitted out of, Dorothy, do you remember how many we had? Oh, was it 203 grants? Lots. We had, that. <laughs> we had 200. <laughs> so, so I, you know, as we, as we pivoted this, we announced it, we took money from here and there to try to make these, um, these grants um, on COVID-19, the impact of this. And I contacted several board members who I knew were skilled at reviewing grants and knew what they were doing. And um, um, I said, you know, we'll probably get 15, 20 of them. We'll divide them up. Everybody will do it. I'll do some, everybody will do it, no problem. And we'll get it. We received 203 applications. Now these are not NIH grants. These are only five or 10 pages, you know, but you know, each one takes you fully an hour to digest, come up with ratings. And then we bring the group together. Well, I think Gail Beck and um, Camilla Benbow, who's the dean at Vanderbilt School, and I think they were ready to kill me when we were all <laughs> confronted with like 40 grants apiece that we had to review. And then we had to have like multiple meetings uh, to um, figure out uh, who the top um, um, winners of these awards were. But people worked remarkably hard. And I, I have to say that within two months of the announcement, the decisions were made and the money was out the door to these young people um, to get started on their work. And the second award winner of these COVID-19 visionary grants well, was um, someone familiar to me and perhaps to others, John Comer, who is uh, simply one of the 
most remarkable young psychologist in this country. He has, he's at Florida International University. He has uh, simply been um, stunningly successful in his career. And no surprise, he um, proposed looking at um, uh, parents and children in a cohort that he had been um, already establishing uh, to see what the impact of COVID was for them. And so John Comer, uh, you know, a, a remarkable young man was the second recipient of the COVID grants. Um, I think too, I, I, you know, apart from thanking all of the board members who were involved in this, um, I, I really need to thank the staff because there's so much work in our program division um, that um, is now under Michelle Ryder's, um, a young psychologist, a social psychologist from the U University of Houston. Um, and, and it's just simply been an amazing amount of work getting all of this started, getting it together and making the decisions, getting the payments out to the institutions so that people could do the work. Uh, pretty amazing. It really is. It really is. And, and when you talk about the COVID grants and the anti-racism grants, we can envision what the impact will be. How do we actually know? How do we measure what the impact is of our grantees' work on the science and practice of psychology, um, as well as the formulation of policy? What can you tell yeah. people about how we measure that and look at it, Terry? You know, the, uh, Dorothy, uh, um, when I first joined the board, when you were chairperson of the board, that was a question that um, I actually posed to staff. And um, in, in a board meeting, I can remember saying, you know, there are many ways of trying to measure these things. Just simply asking the recipients, like, how'd you do? Zero right. to ten, you know, and they'll tell us all ten. They're very happy to get the money and 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 to do good things with it. But you know, we agreed as a group, as as a board, that you know, one metric that I think is kind of universally accepted in our profession is uh, publications in peer-reviewed journals. Now, you could also add to that presentations, posters, you know, APA thing. You know, there's all kinds of ways you can carve this. But I, I, I will say that um, we stuck with just a simple metric, and that metric is a number of publications each year coming from APF grants in peer-reviewed journals. And um, as it's turned out, I, I have to say it was far beyond my expectations, to be honest. Um, we averaged somewhere in the 40s year to year, but... Um, uh, this past year, perhaps not surprisingly, because people have more time because they're at home sitting in front of their computer. Um, we had, the, I believe it was the highest number of publications. I think it was somewhere in the mid 50s publications in peer reviewed journals that we can index. That's a fantastic ledger for us to say the money that we're raising, the resources that we're providing is leading to fundamental new information for our profession, for our field. And to me, that is uh, simply a sign that the vision that Lisa Strauss, Dorothy Cantor, Dave Barlow had many, many years, way before my involvement, but a vision that appealed to me and allowed me to um, um, you know, move into a, a role of leadership in the organization because I just firmly believe in trying to support these young people. It's working. What, what you envisioned is happening right now and we're seeing the products. It's interesting that when I first came on the board, we didn't even track what was happening to our grantees. We were not asking them to give us any feedback. Here's some money, go your merry way. Yeah. And so you can see just in that little piece how APF has grown and developed um, from childhood to adolescence, maybe we're young adults now in terms of what we do yeah. as a foundation. And clearly there's more to do, but even, a, well, it's not small. Finding out what the impact is because as a donor, I wanna know 
that what I do is meaningful, that it's not just being going out there in the air some way. You know, um, I, I, I have some notes here that um, I just, um, uh, of things that I wanted to try to make sure I covered, but you know, the Rosalie Weiss, sadly who passed away this past year, the, the Weiss grant had, it, it, it's, you know, a modest amount of money. It's a thousand dollar award. And, you know, the goal is to do something innovative. Rosalie's grant, the endowment that she gave us had 77 applications for a thousand dollar, one thousand dollar award. That tells you what the impetus is out there for people to work with us. And it also shows us that uh, we have a lot more work to do. We have, um, we have so many good people who are writing to us, who are applying to us, um, whose work we could fund. And, you know, I have to say that, you know, we funded two people out of the 203, Dorothy, the COVID grants. Right. Honestly, in the 40 grants that I reviewed, and I think I said this in one of our Zoom call meetings, 15 of them were of comparable quality. Fifth of the one, and I didn't review all 200. So right. this tells you, and you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I exude confidence in our profession, in our field, in part because I see how many talented young people are out there, how hard they've worked, how many honors they've received in college and in, uh, in graduate school, and how much they want to do good things on behalf of this society. And I just firmly believe that the mission that we are on in APF is a sound one, a valuable one, and it is one that we can all be very proud of. Every single person who um, invests in us. Not to take away from what you said earlier about how much money we give in grants and, and how much we're worth now, a million dollars in grants and $20 million in an endowment. Talk about how that falls short, not just with the new grants, Terry, but in general. Well, we've seen nothing but a spike in the number of applications coming to us. This is true for the small grants that we give out. I mentioned uh, Rosalie Weiss's grant of $1,000, but it's also just as true for, you know, the Dave and Beverly Barlow grant that's um, somewhere shy of $10,000. And, you know, we really, want, um, we really want to be able to fund more of these. When you get 20 and you have 20 in front of you and you know that, you know, five, six, seven, eight of these are all worthy recipients. That's what we want to, to strive for. We want to be able to have the resources to fund the best work, the outstanding work. Right. Not just every applicant. Not just every application. That's an unreasonable expectation because not all applications are good. But the ones that are really good that we, you know, we kind of lament, you know, um, not giving uh, support to. That's uh, that, that's really what we want to try to accomplish. The goal was a million and 20 million. Clearly, we've got to raise that goal. I remember the first time we had a campaign, we set the goal at 4 million, 5 million, I'm sorry, 5 million. And that's when the Coppets grant came in unexpectedly for 4 million. And so we felt we couldn't just say we're going to raise five million and we raised it to seven. Yeah. So, and what did you raise? And you did you did even better, if I'm not mistaken. I, you know, it was a long time ago. And my <laughs> guess is eight and a half, something like that. Yeah. I mean, so, you're, you're, you're talking 15, 20 percent over your goal. Remarkable. What, what I am always amazed at is the incredible generosity yeah. of psychologists who on the whole are not the richest people in the world, yeah. but, yeah. but their interest in what we do and in making it possible for young psychologists to keep moving gets demonstrated every time we get another contribution. It's really a beautiful thing to behold. I, I couldn't agree more. And an example of that is the Envision 
ending racism campaign. Right. This was a this was a bright light of an idea that was generated in one of our small group meetings that we thought we would put into play at the APA remote convention. And right. that very night, Dorothy, we raised more than um, more than twenty thousand dollars, or just about twenty thousand dollars, to support another visionary grant. Well, we have a guardian angel, actually a guardian angel in your in your old state of New Jersey, yes. who, was, who, who was so, who was, uh, so touched by the initiative and how it was characterized that we received enough money from her to probably add two or three uh, additional grants to the visionary grants for ending racism. And it, it will not surprise me if we will have four or five um, envision ending racism anti-racism grants uh, this year in 2020. Um, this is remarkable. This year. Uh, 2021. Come on. Come 2021. On. Um, we're, 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 stuck, we're stuck in this year of, um, uh, of challenges, really, honestly. You know, there are other, there are other kinds of grants, too. And uh, this is uh, per perhaps parochial because I um, study trauma, as you mentioned, I, I think most people know that I'm very involved and have been for more than 40 years trying to improve the lives of people exposed to horrific violence. And um, the Fund for Trauma Psychology was established um, some years back. And um, we were able to, with the help of incredibly generous people, um, we were able to begin the process of giving out grants and um, in trauma psychology um, four years ago. We're now in our fifth, the fifth grant will be in 2021. And um, that, that, that to me- You learn uh, fast. Yeah, I, I may be slow at the start, but I do pick it up. Um, it, it was really um, um, remarkable to me when we gave out the first grant. And um, I remember as it turned out, I went to the University of North Carolina at uh, Greensboro, like within a year after the first recipient had been, somewhat accidentally. Um, and I was speaking um, with the provost of UNC Greensboro. And I said, well, you know, you have a APF trauma uh, fund grant recipient here. It's the first one. And lo and behold, didn't they all know about this young spectacular faculty member whose name is Blair Wisco, by the way, who um, just did fabulous things with this, um, this relatively small grant. Um, a couple of years ago, an attorney at Georgetown uh, called me on a, a Saturday afternoon at 3.30. I was uh, sadly and unfortunately in my office at uh, VA Boston at the center and um, um, I picked up the phone, which I think shocked her. And she said, I was going to try to leave you a message. I didn't expect to get you. But she had um, raised funds for um, uh, Christine Blasey Ford, whom I think everyone likely knows, um, for her protection um, when things got particularly challenging for Dr. Ford. And um, she said, I have money that's left over. This is now some many months after um, uh, the, the scene had subsided. And um, she said, I'd like to do something with it. And, you know, she, you know, I, after the conversation, I said, well, you know, um, you can only create a fund when you have a certain amount of money, like $100,000 or something like this is what we have as a the threshold, just because of a variety of reasons doesn't matter. And I said, but if you put it into the fund uh, for trauma psychology, and we are able to segregate out your resources for sexual assault, either prevention or intervention, then I think we might be able to um, right away give out an award in Dr. Ford's name. And of course, that has now happened. That money yep. has uh, generated, and we will have um, our first award recipient now in 2020. And um, these two grants, um, as it turned out, both grants this year were on sexual assault. And um, one of them is to create an app to help uh, people in the recovery process. And um, th the second one was, um, let me see if I can remember now. The second grant was on um, risk and resilience, I think, factors in, in recovery. Um, but the numbers of grants, again, just amazing. And, you know, the Fund for Trauma Psychology, you know, it, 
it, it covers certainly combat veterans and it, um, military, um, active duty military, and it also covers industrial accidents, moving vehicle accidents, and um, um, uh, domestic violence, and all of these you know, amazing areas. Um, we need more than the $150,000 that's in that particular fund right now. And, um, and we will be able to do good things. And the fact that we now have a Dr. Ford grant and a Fund for Trauma Psychology grant, both of which are focused on uh, sexual assault is, I think, very encouraging for the future. So um, I'm very appreciative of all of the support that has come into this fund and will happen. <clears throat> Indeed, I, you know, I, I was thinking that um, although APF is a separate 501c3, we are our own foundation, we do have a longstanding relationship with APA uh, on, from APA on our board, which right now is Sharon Berry. But can you say a little bit about how we work with APA and what, how they, well, sure. Well, APA is an enormous benefactor um, for the APF, uh, not necessarily in funding, although many members of APA uh, provide support to us on an annual basis and also in legacy gifts as well. There's, there are many- Even through people. their dues, even that we have a line yeah. on the due statement. And we, uh, we collect thousands of dollars through the due statement, yeah. But I think most people don't really understand or appreciate or realize, nor should they, that you know, our office space, our phones, our computers are all provided to us um, by uh, the APA. And you know, we work with Arthur Evans, we work with you know, Archie Turner, who's a spectacular man whom I just deeply love and has been hugely helpful to me um, as the incoming board chairman. Um, and, uh, just the, the guidance that we get from the APA uh, routinely. And and I don't know if anyone saw, but if you've got the APA monitor, I still get it in hard copy. I like hard copy things. But, but, but the magnificent um, uh, page on the Envision Ending Racism campaign, um, and I think it was in October, November, December, maybe, something like this. And you they're know, all just, the same now, Terry. They're October, all the same. December, all the same. Well, I mean, there you there you have it. And but it was just beautiful and it was so well positioned for us. So what does APA do for us? They do a lot for us. And I hope, and I hope that the board of APA appreciates what we do for psychology and what we do for APA in turn, because we have this incredible working relationship and um, we are bringing psychology to the masses, which has been an objective of the APA for now decades. So, I mean, I hope we have, well, I, I believe we have a great working relationship, but there could be things that you're not telling me, Dorothy, that I need to know about. Nothing that I've heard, but I thought we shouldn't, we shouldn't. let that go by because we do get a great deal from APA. Um, besides the at home series that we are now a part of, um, how else have we managed to stay in touch with our donors and how do we plan to stay in touch with them while travel is so, still so limited? Well, I think, I think we have to be careful. You know, we have to be cautious. We have to be smart about managing this pandemic and we don't really know. Um, actually, I was just telling my group um, um, yesterday in a meeting, I thought that we would know more in three or four weeks what the outlook is gonna be. You know, <clears throat> I think we're approaching 25 million people vaccinated. There's some estimates that there's 100 million people who actually contracted COVID, you know, who knows really. Mm -hmm. um, and, and do they have the antibodies? You know, if they do, we're really well along the way, but we're not gonna know. Well, I if they have, be, and they last, but that's another story. That's another story. And will they, continue to work for these variants that are out there. The South right. Africa variant is a problem. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna continue doing APF at home. We, we are manning the phones. We are staying in touch with our friends. You know, I, me I mentioned the guardian angels that are out there. There are many of them. 
and we we want to maintain our relationship with them because these are people who can see what we're doing and how we're doing the work that they themselves feel strongly about. And I just feel that um, um, the more information we can give, and that was the purpose of today's um, uh, panel here is that, you know, I wanna convey to people that we do appreciate it. We are still working. We are working hard to uh, try to make things continue to work. And we had, as I opened up with, as you asked me, we had a great year. We had an amazing year and the board is continuing to try to do good things. And so I'm quite happy. And I think APA has made the decision that there will not be an in-person convention this summer. Um, I, I believe that is the case, but I think there's still some semblance of hope that there may be a hybrid model. Um, All right. At but, least but that's- I was gonna say to those of our friends, um, I think you're right, they won't decide for sure till April. But what I wanted to say is that for those who would ordinarily have been coming to APA and who might not get there again, we had a lot of fun with our cocktail party last year for donors. We, we for a bunch of old people, we're pretty creative, <laughs> Terry. We have figured out how to bring everybody in. And I would say, I will take the liberty of saying, anybody who is with us now can always reach out to APF, yeah. to me directly, to Terry directly, to other board members, because we love to hear from you. We love to interact with you. Yeah. You are the APF family. So let me move on, Terry. What do you think we can look forward to in 2021 and beyond? Well, <clears throat> I, I can't give you too many uh, details yet, but um, 2021 at not even the end of the month of January is shaping up to be another astounding year for the APF. Um, some of you likely know that um, uh, we um, had a bequest many, many, many years ago that um, um, is now just being realized. And it's a, a very significant gift and it's coming from um, members of our community. One was a psychologist, one was not, was a business person. And um, they're good. Terry, you just froze. Okay. Helen, what do we do when someone's frozen? Um, I am not entirely sure. Um, okay, I'll keep talking until he unfreezes, but somebody call him on his cell phone and tell him that he's frozen. I, I, I'll go on. I, talking about what Terry was talking about, which is this incredible legacy gift. And, you know, when we get legacy gifts, um, I have to tell you, we always hope they won't mature for a long time. We don't want our donors to be lost to us so that we, just so we get their money, we are not like that. But when something like this happens that can make a significant difference, um, it's really very rewarding and very exciting for us. And you know that even the donor, though he or she is gone, knew what he or she was doing in making this uh, legacy gift to the foundation. And um, I've done it. I'm pretty sure Terry has done it. And many of our board members have. Um, for those of you seeing only me, our staff is trying to get Terry back. Um, I know you're here to hear from him, but I can vamp till ready. And let me say something more about our staff. Um, 
Terry mentioned the young people we have, some of whom have come aboard without having ever met in person. Michelle Ryder was interviewed on, on a Zoom call. And it's a true challenge to staff who don't know each other well or hadn't before, but everybody is working to the full extent that time allows. And I know they all work beyond their allotted hours and never say boo, they don't get overtime. They just do it because I think everybody who comes to work for APF realizes how important the work we're doing and therefore the work they're doing is not only to the future of psychology, but to the future of um, society because so much of our grant making is like the COVID grants and the ending racism grants and the sexual assault grants um, really have a, a long-term impact on society. One of the things that always has impressed me is how much of our research, particularly on LGBTQ plus through the Platchek grants and others, has been used to influence policy in the government, both in the states and in the federal government. And that makes what we do important on still another level. So as Terry was saying earlier, we will get 40 or 50 publications now from grantees. But um, the fact that then those the work that they've done becomes a part of a bigger influence. It doesn't just wind up in a journal on a shelf. Um, it's useful. So I'm going to just see if there are any chats here, any questions? No. Um, we've tried texting Terry to see why he was got frozen. And um, if any of you has any questions, this would be the time to ask them. I know you want to hear Terry's answers, but I've been on the board for long enough that I can probably respond to almost anything you ask. Oh, we can you. Well, <clears throat> um, I'm sorry internet crash, so I just pulled you up on my phone. My apologies. Oh, I, listen, thank you for coming back because I was just vamping till ready, Terry. You will someday see the video. Well, well, I'm hoping you did your soft shoe. Oh, yes, absolutely. So the question I wanted to ask you is, what's the reward for you personally, Terry, of being so involved in APF? You give it so much time and energy and thought and money, what's, what's in it for you? And I know there's something. Well, I, now this wasn't on the script, was it, Dorothy? I know, I just made that one up while vamping. <laughs> Little startled. So for me, um, even as a young boy, I wanted to be very involved and active in a community. And, um, the communities have changed my life, but I not only want good at what I did, whatever that happened to have been. Come closer to your mic, Terry, because you're breaking up a little bit. Yeah, my apologies. That's okay. Um, <clears throat> but my, you know, my my goal in life was to try to contribute across the board to not be solely good at my profession or my field, but rather to try to um, influence the direction in positive and favorable ways of my community. When I think Dave Barlow approached me initially and he told me what you all are doing. You know, I've been in AP, I've been virtually all the APA meetings for 40 years. 
um, but was never really involved. But when Dave sort of um, invited me to one of the meetings to talk about APF, I felt like this was something that I could really sink my teeth into. Uh, now, I never thought I would be um, board chair. Um, I thought that was um, not necessarily in the cards, but for a variety of reasons, it turned out four years ago, um, um, it, the chair was open and um, Dorothy called me and talked with me about it. And I felt that maybe this was something where I could um, exert a degree of leadership and um, all towards doing a good thing. So, you know, the, the pay isn't so great as you likely remember, Dorothy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the rewards are terrific. I mean, look at the great people that I have to inter interact with, you know? I mean, our board is really a wonderful board, a wonderful group of people. And I look forward to when we can get together. You know, we've had two Zoom board meetings at least and many other smaller meetings, um, but there's nothing like um, being able to go out to dinner with folks. And that to me is really, really an important thing. But I think you're at, we, the those of us on the board really, not only are we dedicated, but we like each other. And it's a really remarkable group of people. I yeah. did get one question yeah. while, while you were gone. <laughs> and that was, are there any new initiatives or things being planned at this point, Terry, that you well, can talk about? Well, there are. Yeah, no, let me, um, let, let, well, you know, of course the envision racism grants, the anti-racism things, they're, they're coming along right away. And um, <clears throat> we, we actually received several different bequests over the course of the last year that were um, in many ways unanticipated, unanticipated. There's a psychologist named Lorraine Ida, E-Y-D-E, -E, who's not somebody that I really personally knew, but she worked in the Office of Personnel Management, OPM for the federal government until she was well into her 80s. So she was young when she quit Dorothy. And um, she, when she passed on in her late eighties, she left us um, a bequest. And um, this bequest is uh, to try to support the use of the empirical use, the empirical verification validation of psychological testing. And so a small group of the board got together, we wrote out it. And so now that's going out, it's a new grant. Um, Richard Moreland's dissertation award that's all, um, that's all uh, new resources, new money coming our way. Uh, the Minority Fellowship Program, that's just really um, a group that's been working on this for a long, long time um, um, that in my, in, in my view have done spectacular, and they've passed a threshold of $250,000 so that we will begin to uh, make awards um, to um, underrepresented minorities to study neuropsychology, neuroscience and uh, related matters. So um, these are all new things. And um, uh, you know, the violence prevention, which has always been a theme for us, you know, given the remarkable violence that uh, our citizens in this country experience. Um, we raised enough money for three of these awards at our soiree, you may remember back in October of 19, and those grants will be, um, um, w w those awards will be made now this year. So, you, you know, is there new stuff coming? Yeah, and we try to keep our finger on the pulse, Dorothy, and you know, the, the transition to COVID, the um, increased um, targeting, indexing of um, uh, anti-racism grants, these are, um, really just um, wonderful, wonderful new additions to our um, efforts to try to do something that's societally relevant and timely. Talk a little bit, I don't know if anyone in this group has heard about how we work our visionary grant program. And for those of you who aren't aware, we have over the years tried to build the reserves in the visionary grants because those are the ones that are not designated by the donor. You know that if you're a donor and you give a substantial amount of money, you say what you want the money to be used for, just like Dr. Ike did with the testing integrity. But the visionary funds, the non-designated funds allow us to do other things. So tell 
the people here how we use them and how we determine what will be the priorities, please? Yeah, great, uh, great uh, question for me. So the visionary grant, this is our bread and butter. These are the non-designated funds that we uh, that we are able to raise. And the visionary grants are, you know, relatively large. They can be anywhere from ten to twenty thousand dollars in size and scope. And that's a significant amount of money for young people to get things started. So these are very important. They're a very important part of our. And so how do we decide the areas? Well, let me just say that uh, we made the decision again, uh, pivoting quickly, that we would use some of the visionary money for the COVID epidemic. And that's really where the money came from was the, the, the undesignated funds that we, um, that we collect. And that to me was just a fantastic. We could have used, you know, way more money in that pot um, um, to support the programs that uh, were proposed to us. But we thought that two would be good, and it was good, and we selected two wonderful people. The problem was, of course, we got 203 applications. Have I mentioned that we got 203? Yeah, I um, think so. I remember that number. <laughs> and uh, that is, 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 these are stunning numbers. So the visionary is our bread and butter. And um, the way in which we decide this is through board effort, board vision. Um, we solicit input from people and we select what the topic areas will be. We advertise them in you know, the monitor and on our website. And that's how people know what it is that we're looking for. Um, and um, uh, it, it, you know, it changes. Let, let me just say we've updated, we've changed, we've modified, and um, we continue to still try to do um, good things, timely things, important things. Stay at the vanguard, stay at the, um, the edge of the sphere. Yeah. That's really where we can keep up with the times. Exactly. The, the designated gifts, not that they're not wonderful, and I am not demeaning them in the least, as you know, no. but they have a different way of operating that yeah. the, the foundation has less to say about. Right. And, and they both have their role. We both know exactly. that. They both have their role, and we want to encourage any kind of uh, support for our APF objectives and goals. Um, but some people uh, like to designate; they have a certain thing. You know, I, I, you know, initiated the fund for trauma psychology. Why? Because the need is so great, and it's an area that I've spent my entire career. That's what I wanted to do. Now, what I didn't really fully appreciate when I started uh, that work was uh, how much already the board had covered issues of violence and trauma and the like. And um, and so I kind of went off in my own little direction. It was worthwhile as it turns out. Um, I have a tendency to go into my own direction. That's fair enough. Um, but um, um, but it could have actually been, it could have fallen into um, a, um, into a visionary grant as well. And um, um, perhaps today I would have done it differently, but um, I know now way more than I knew seven or eight years ago. That's what happens. We hope we know more. Thankfully. Than we did <laughs> seven or eight years ago. That's a good song. Um, is there anything we haven't covered that you would like to add, Terry? Well, if I haven't covered it um, enough, let me just thank um, the staff members of APF who are really working um, overtime on our behalf. I think the foundation is doing so well and Miriam's exerting such um, wonderful leadership and the board is helping in every way possible. And um, I wanna just express my appreciation to staff and to board members and to our supporters, to our stakeholders, to our um, philanthropists for helping us here. Now, I just got a question that's really vital and it comes from a a participant who is into interior design who wants to know what color your the name of your paint color. <laughs> I love I, that there's somebody here with a really good <laughs> sense of humor. Um, I, I hope it's not who I think it might be who's asking me, but it is I'm a telling, although you could find out by going on chat, my dear. Um, <laughs> Um, 
uh, if, if you want a funny five minute routine, uh, there is a Saturday night live routine on Pharaoh and ball paint. And I would encourage anyone to go on to see it. It is hysterically funny and it's worth the five minutes for sure. Just put in SNL and Farrell and Ball Paint and you'll get a good laugh. Okay, that's very good. Now, I would like to take this opportunity to say something about you. I wanna thank you for all that you do for APF because with all the other people that we've thanked, I know how much work the chair of APF does. And I know how the chair of APF and particularly you serve as an inspiration to both the staff and the board members. And you're not somebody who pats himself on the back. I know that. But if we were in person, I would pat you on the back and give you a hug and say, thank you, thank you, thank you, Terry, because you have just been remarkable through some very trying times, not just this past year, but some other issues that we've had before that, which we managed to do without it being a detriment to APF. And that is truly a credit to you. And we are very fortunate that you're there and you are gonna be a tough act to follow. And I hope that like our, um, legacy gift givers that you're not going to mature out of this role too soon either <laughs> we want to keep you around and doing what you're doing because you really have just been a blessing for um, APA. i thank you it, it, um thank you so much dorothy it's been a pleasure to serve in this role it was a pleasure to serve on the board and to be the board chair um, for these years now has been a highlight of my career. And um, you, you said it very well, we, we've become friends. We're colleagues, of course, but we've become friends as a board and you know, you know, forged in um, iron, forged in um, uh, flame. And um, we have actually done, I think, pretty remarkable things as a group. And, um, I look forward to every single opportunity to interact with the board and to interact with our stakeholders who are really, to, to an individual, absolutely lovely folks, absolutely lovely folks who are doing good things for us. Well, by definition, if they are our folks, they are lovely and good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the two go hand in hand. Yeah. And like you, I'm very grateful always to our donors who are what keep us going and will keep us going into the future. Um, it will be very exciting to get the legacy gift that you were talking about. Yeah. It, it will open up new avenues for us, but there is so much work to be done. Yeah. And as you said, 203 applicants for one grant just represents one grant. What do we figure, 90% of the grants that could be funded don't get funded? Some well, I think we, we don't even fund 10%. I, yeah, we're more competitive than um, some of the, um, the institutes in Washington. Um, and that, that's not necessarily an ideal place for us to be. We'd like to be funding no. 15, 20% anyway. That's, well, that's part of our new goal then. I think so. I Which think so. Ever moving up goal because the more people hear about us, the more they turn to us. Yes, and that's, that's right. And that's a really good thing in terms of the growth and development of APF. More that's people true. know about us to apply for grants and more people thankfully know about us to donate. And I think that is a very happy note to end on. It is. So everybody out there, Stay well, get yourselves vaccinated, and sooner rather than later, I hope, we'll see each other in person. Goodbye, Terry. Bye, dear. Thank you all very much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Bye-bye.